Okay, so it looks like it is 11 o'clock right on the nose. Once again, I just want to say welcome and good morning to everybody who has chosen to spend an hour of their Friday with us. I'm going to be going over a few things just as I do every time we do this weekly webinar. And can you even believe it's week six of this webinar? I can't believe it, which I guess also means it's been that long since COVID really in infiltrated our minds and our workplaces. So everyone should probably reach around and give themselves a pat on the back for surviving these past six weeks. Um, I know it's been very, very uh, unpredictable, a roller coaster of, of scenarios and we're all here and we've all survived. All right, so here's what we're going to be doing today. First of all, welcome to those of you who are brand new to us. I know that every week we have anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 new participants who join us for this weekly webinar series. And we're really happy that you have decided to join us. What we're going to be going over is a welcome by Aaron Phillips. And Aaron and I work hand in hand. He is my partner in the human capital side of our firm's business. Then we're going to be delving into an introduction of today's presenters. And there are two presenters today, myself, who will be speaking with you for the first half of our time together, and then attorney Mark Kuhar, who will be spending the final 30 minutes with you answering some questions. And as you can see, it shows exactly what it is we will be covering today. Uh, I will just make one little note that I wanted to bring everybody up to speed on. We had nine different questions submitted to Mark uh, to answer for the second half of today's session. So what I've decided to do is to only cover training and development as well as performance management uh, for the first 30 minutes of my time so that we can definitely allow Mark enough time to answer all nine questions. I am hopeful that after Mark has had a chance to answer those nine questions, we will also have additional time for Mark to answer more live questions that you would be typing in throughout the course of our webinar today. We're gonna have to play that by ear. However, let me just tell you, if we run out of time for him to answer new questions, I'm going to make a note of all of those questions and I will work with Mark to get the answers uh, compiled in a written format and then email the questions and answers out to everybody so that you still get the benefit of the live Q&A. So please don't be shy, type in your questions, Again, hoping we have a chance to get to all the brand new questions after we cover the first nine that were submitted prior to today's webinar. But if we don't, you'll still get your questions answered. So please make sure you do that. All right, so here's a little introduction of today's presenters. So um, this is a little bit about me. For those of you who've been with us week to week, you're already familiar with this. I'm only showing this so that you can appreciate the perspective from which I'm coming when I give the insights that I give related to these weekly webinars. As you can see, I am absolutely not a lawyer. I am absolutely not a medical professional. But what I am is an experienced and seasoned human resource and organizational development executive. You can see very clearly the different industries with which I've had experience as well as my educational and credentialing background. Uh, I'd also like to give you a chance to meet Aaron Phillips. Uh, so just give me one moment. Let me pull Aaron up here. Um, but I'd like to give you a chance to meet Aaron Phillips who also is um, someone with whom I work very, very closely, as I said. So Aaron, I'm going to unmute you. And if you could just do a welcome and, and share a few words of what's on your mind this week before we good, get into things. Good morning. Can you hear me, Elizabeth? Yes, I can. All right. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. You know, as Elizabeth mentioned, we, you know, we've got approximately 20 new participants each week. And you know, the people that keep coming back, you know, usually we're averaging 80, 85 people. And so we're so appreciative of everyone taking the time out of their schedule on Friday to spend with us. Um, Elizabeth, uh, a special thank you to Elizabeth, the amount of time she puts into making sure that this is a weekly uh, benefit to all of our potential, you know, customers, ones that we deal with, ones we don't. Uh, and so, so, so appreciative of Elizabeth and everything she's done. And, and Mark, you know, and, and the ability to have Mark Kuhar here this morning uh, with us, uh, you know, certainly uh, we've, uh, Mark and I have worked together uh, for almost 20 years and greatly appreciate his 
uh, willingness to help uh, provide guidance uh, to everyone. And so thank you to everyone for being here, sh sharing your Friday with us. Uh, we're excited um, to talk about the topics we have and excited to cover the uh, compliance questions that are coming up. So again, thanks again uh, to Elizabeth and Mark and, and all of you on the phone. And we, uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to provide this to all, uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, I appreciate it. So a couple things that I just wanted to mention. Um, for those of you I, who are on this call, and we have a lot of people not only from the state of Pennsylvania, but a lot of people from New York, and we have some people that join us week to week from other states such as Ohio and Illinois, um, as well as Indiana. So for one thing that I wanted to just respond to based upon some feedback I received and, and questions that I had been asked from some of you who've been with us regularly from the state of New York, I have great news for you. I am this close to finalizing the New York State Attorney who will be joining us on a biweekly basis to also participate in the live Q&A with an attorney format that we have just started as of last week with Mark Kuhar, who of course is an attorney in the state of, of Pennsylvania. So I just wanted to share that good news. I'm really excited about that. And I think everyone's really going to get a lot of benefit. Having said that, let me just clarify one other thing. Don't forget that much of what we're talking about as it relates to legal compliance and, and all the ever-changing legislation is something that is focused on federal legislation. So I wanted to just give you peace of mind. The vast majority of what you hear from Mark is applicable to all of you, even though he practices in the state of Pennsylvania, because much of what he's talking about has federal implications. However, as we get down to the minutia of detail relative to state requirements and legal um, considerations. I wanted to again give you great news that we are going to be having a New York State attorney join us and I've already spoken with Mark and he and the New York State attorney will both be live and, and tag teaming the question and answer portion. So stay tuned for that. All right. So here's a little bit about Mark Kuhar. Again, you're not gonna hear from him till a little bit later today, but I at least wanted you to see how you can go about getting in contact with him. And also I wanted you to get a feel for what his areas of expertise are. I will tell you that Mark did an excellent job already from the very first week of joining us last week in following up directly with those of you who had more specific questions that you had submitted to he and, and myself uh, after the webinar. So please don't be shy. That that's what it's all about. He is here to answer questions, not only in a live format like this, but we understand that some of you for various reasons might feel more comfortable following up with him one-on-one. -on -one. So please feel free to either email him and myself uh, at the email address you see there. And all of you have my email address, of course, or feel free to give him a call. Another friendly reminder on Thursday the 14th, I will be co-presenting with Wei Shin Lei, and that will be a webinar that takes place from 11 to noon through the Erie Regional Chamber and Growth Partnership. I will be sending out a, an announcement and a link that you can click on in order to register for that. And what we'll be talking about is a real treat because Wei Shin is definitely a subject matter expert in the medical field and of course in the field of epidemiology. Uh, Wei Shin, for those of you who may or may not be familiar, is a very successful entrepreneur with a, an extremely successful business that happens to be based here out of Erie, Pennsylvania, but she is known all over the world with the success that her, uh, her business has, has really taken on. So uh, before her life as a business owner, Wei Shin was a uh, doctor. She had her own practice and she also is a very accomplished scientist in epidemiology. So she will be covering for this particular webinar all of the medical and scientific considerations and information that you're going to want to know as you are in the midst of either gearing up for or experiencing a restart. And then I will come in for the last portion of that and cover the compliance side of reentry from an HR standpoint. For those of you who join us every week, I will be able to get into much more detail in this format uh, through the 
through the webinar on the 14th than I'm able to here on the weekly formats that we do only because we cover so much for the weekly formats and this will be able to you know provide us with a lot more detail. Another thing I just want to make sure everyone knows of so everything runs smoothly today, Mark will be answering your previously submitted questions first. But as I said in the beginning, please don't be shy and type your additional questions in the Q&A dialog box. He will either answer them live if we have time or if we don't, he will definitely answer them. He and I will work together to get those questions answered and then get you the responses in the follow-up materials that I, I always send after each webinar. So now we're gonna delve into the prepared topic and I'm doing a time check. All right, perfect, it's 11.11. So I'm going to be really good about making sure that I don't go over the 11.30 mark because we wanna to get to all of those earlier submitted questions for Mark. But as far as the prepared topic, we're going to be focusing on part one of, of what we really want you to be mindful of as it relates to adjusting your people management practices. And, the term the new normal has been overused and probably a lot of you are sick and tired of hearing it, but really it, it articulates exactly what all of us are facing in a way that no other two words can. None of us would have imagined, of course, that we'd be sitting here talking about this even just two months ago, but here we are. And we wanna walk you through in a multi-part series for the prepared topic portion of these weekly webinars, the various aspects of managing your people and developing your people that you're going to want to prepare for and things you're going to want to think about so you can stand the biggest chance of success as you're trying to continue operations and some sense of normalcy and ideally success through all the ebbs and flows of what COVID-19 will continue to provide. So let's start with this. When it comes to training and development, obviously coronavirus is, is it really is. It's challenging every single one of you on this webinar today to rethink your approach, your approach to many different things. But right now we're gonna talk about your approach to training. And I wanna just point out, it's kind of funny I'm saying this because the format that makes the most sense for a webinar format is to use, um, you know, we choose to use the, the app of Zoom. And then of course, we're communicating with you and showing you the material through PowerPoint slides. But a webinar format is very, very different than what true training and development is. And I just wanna point out to everybody, while you certainly can use uh, PowerPoint slides and WebEx integrated into your training and development approach, it's not as simple as what you see right now today with a PowerPoint slide deck slapped up in front of the screen and your employees being able to look at that and get everything covered. Because let's not forget, right? When it comes to training and development, even though many of you, especially in the state of Pennsylvania, are gearing up for your employees to come back into the workplace as of this coming Monday, your, what, what you have to do to train and transfer knowledge to them is going to look very different from what it looked like before. And since many of you are probably inundated with just trying to get all of the tactical things covered so that you can safely reopen as per whatever the you know, respective state or federal guidelines are, I wanna give you some things to think about. So what are some things that you can do? Well, first of all, I wanna make sure, and we at DA wanna make sure that you know how important it is to use a very innovative method of designing how you're going to transfer knowledge through the, the act of training and development within your organization. Now it's impossible for the time that we have allowed, of course, for me to get into every little minutia of detail, but I will tell you, while I'm giving you nuggets of very important things to think about and things to consider and even some recommendations of what you could uh, possibly really start actively looking into. I'm also going to be sending, as I do every single week, some supplemental information. I either tomorrow or Monday I do after each webinar that includes some specific resources for you to tap into. Um, and what I'm talking about right now for this slide has to do with resources for instructional design. Now, for those of you on this call who have a, a training and development or instructional design background as I do, I'm sure you've heard of one of the most common uh, 
you know, common um, models for instructional design, which is called the ADDI model. Um, and the ADDI model is a method that you can see right there on the screen. And it starts, it's an acronym, of course, A-D-D-I-E. And it starts with analyzing, you know, what it is that you really want to achieve in terms of what performance gap you would like to cover through training. Then you get into designing that material. And as you're designing that material, it's very important for you to not only outline what the overall performance objectives are. In other words, let's say that in plain language, what would success look like? So once your employees were trained, what would it look like? In other words, what would they be doing differently or better than what they are doing now or what they were doing before they engaged in that training and development with you? Then you're going to want to move on if, after you've figured out what those objectives are and after you've figured out, of course, in the first step, what the, what the gaps of knowledge are, then you're going to want to get into developing your training. Uh, this is where I really want to focus for the things that are important for you to consider today. And things I want you to consider is the fact that, you know, not only do you have to worry about the knowledge gap? Not only do you have to worry about, you know, identifying what success would look like once they've completed your training, but especially in the wake of COVID-19, if you think it's ever going to be exactly like it once was, you're lying to yourself. There are going to be changes, and like I said earlier, ebbs and flows that I don't know what they are, and quite honestly, you know, no human being on the planet really knows what they are. We're they, you know, scientists and epidemiologists have their best guess, but no one really knows how this virus is going to wax and wane until hopefully, uh, you know, some sort of a vaccine can be found. But in the meantime, what we do know is that we're going to have to be utilizing technology a lot more so than we ever did before. So it's going to be really important for you in your organization to make sure whoever you identify as the person in charge of training, as the person who's delivering training, either one, you have to identify someone who is very open-minded and capable of learning the various technologies that they're now going to have to use in order to maximize that learning, or number two, you're going to have to identify external providers, third, third party providers, who can assist in that process. Uh, so I want to just make sure you understand that. So what am I talking about when I say understanding and learning the technology? There are different features on various platforms, such as Zoom even, that have virtual collaboration rooms. And I'm sure many of you on this call have even had uh, participated in, in Zoom meetings and Zoom conferences or Zoom webinars where there was some breakout discussion in virtual breakout rooms. That's what I'm talking about. That's just one example of a feature. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because it's important that you don't just, that you don't attempt to transfer knowledge by having someone just lecturing, staring at the screen and lecturing. I know that's kind of funny and I'm even laughing to myself as I say this because the format of our webinars is such that we're trying to give a little bit of a flavor of lots of different things uh, in the way that we do now. And we really leave the, the interactive part of it towards the end when we use a feature such as the live Q&A where you type things in or you submit things ahead of time and then we interact in that way. But it's very, very important that whatever you do, you don't just rely on someone uh, as an, such as an employee of yours sitting there and either being lectured at or someone just sitting there and being expected to just read. That is not how knowledge is transferred. So here are some other suggestions, things that I've done. You can implement something like a teach back and I'm sure many of you have part in training or you yourselves maybe have even delivered training where you have an opportunity for the students to, you know, Think critically, take a look at different situations and circumstances as it relates to the subject matter that you are trying to train them on. And then they not only have a chance to evaluate those situations, but then they get to really implement 
how they apply what it is that they heard from you and what they learned from you to actually work through those problems and suggest improvements and then have an opportunity to talk through those. And you can do this by also using things such as structured learning communities. Now, this is going to take some preparation in advance, of course, and any good training would, especially if you follow that very uh, common Addy model that I showed you a couple slides ago. But you want to make sure that you put the effort on the front end to make sure it's as interactive as possible, utilizing technology, utilizing creative and innovative solutions. But you want to try to follow this 70-20-10 learning model and all of the training, all of the development that we do at Decision Associates and that, that I myself has done throughout, have done throughout my entire career follows the 70-20-10 learning model. So what is that? When I'm asking you to consider following this model and incorporating it into your training and development so that you can really succeed amidst uh, COVID-19, what I'm talking about is, look at this, 70% of your learning, of the learning of your employees takes place through experience. In other words, it takes place through them actually having to work through situations evaluate it, process it, apply what it is that you have taught them in what has taken place in the tiny little circle that says 10%, and that is the structured learning. So the structured learning is only 10% of what you're going to be doing. Yet oftentimes organizations and managers make the mistake of focusing 90% of their time, if not more, on the structured learning and then forgetting about the other 90% of what really helps new information to stick. So 20%, that's where you have an opportunity to learn by hearing the experiences and the insights of others who are going through that learning experience with you. So let me just say that differently because I know we're jumping all around and, and I'm trying to make really good use of our time. Basically what I'm saying is, when you are developing a training and development approach method in your organization, and I don't care, by the way, if you're teaching things such as how to operate a new piece of machinery versus how to, um, you know, how to do a very complex, uh, you know, problem solving situation that someone has to work through or if you're training somebody a group of managers on how to be effective in managing a re remote team let's say i don't care what it is you are training people about you want to follow this model so about 10 percent of that learning needs to take place through the structured content that you create in advance aka a classroom setting a virtual classroom setting 20% of that learning will take place based upon what they hear in the exchanges that they're having with the other people who are learning that and uh, you know, hearing the other people's questions and hearing the things that they have come up with as possible ways of tackling what it is they've learned about. But 70% of that learning takes place through them actually having a chance to get their hands dirty, play with it, apply it, practice it, and apply the information and the knowledge that you convey to them through that structured content. That's how the learning model needs to look. So I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that and you think about that as, as you are figuring out how to approach training and development post COVID-19 and in the midst of COVID-19. If you need any help with that, please reach out, let me know. I've literally dedicated my career <laughs> to uh, organizational development and employee development for, as you saw on the slide in the beginning, and I'm really happy to just even answer questions or bounce some ideas uh, off, of, off of you if that's what you would like. All right, so now we're gonna transition to the topic of performance management. Every single one of you on this call, you're facing challenges as it relates to evaluating performance. And also you're facing challenges as it relates to providing meaningful feedback. I have received several different emails and calls from many of you who have webinars asking me to talk through with you how to deal with a performance related concern or hey, Elizabeth, how can I even make sure my employees are, 
are doing what it is they're supposed to when I'm not even working side by side with them or even the same building, many times even in the same county <laughs> as, uh, as we were when before COVID-19 hit. Two things I wanna say to you. Thing number one, please remember, this is a topic and the topic I'm talking about is managing a remote work team. This is a topic that we covered in great detail, I think at this point, maybe three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. And for those of you who uh, were a part of it, you received a toolkit that I had created. I think it's about maybe eight or nine pages. It's a manager's toolkit that I had created and developed for you to follow that helps you take into account specific tactical things you can do to make sure you are appropriately, you know, there for your employees and giving them the feedback they need and evaluating their performance. So if you don't have that, email me separately and I'll send it to you. Just shoot me a quick email after today and I'll send it to you. So that's the one thing I wanna remind you of as a resource. But now I wanna talk a little bit more on a larger scale and talk about the fact that it's really important if you're going to survive this COVID-19 epidemic, but even beyond that, okay? I really truly believe that COVID-19, although it has had a lot of negative um, you know, impacts on, on those of us within either you know, the business community or nonprofit community, any of us who are trying to, to function, it's also had some positive impacts. And one thing I wanna press on in terms of some positive impact is that the tradi traditional approach to performance management is being called into question because it's not even possible. It's not possible for all the obvious reasons that we've been experiencing. So I want you to think about something that I've been a big believer in long before COVID-19, but it's going to be ever so important from here on out if you want to be a high performing organization with minimal turnover, um, voluntary turnover I'm saying that is, and that is in the moment feedback. In the moment feedback is so important. Uh, what I'm talking about is making sure that your employees never have to question where they stand. They never have to question how what they're doing fits into the bigger picture. They never have to question whether or not you, uh, you, know, you approve of or are pleased with the output that they are producing in their position. I really believe many organizations have gotten lazy honestly, uh, prior to COVID-19, and, and many even still, in the sense that they don't manage on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not there as an interactive manager or supervisor or developer of their employees on a week-to-week, day-to-day basis, and instead, they lazily rely upon the annual performance review. And oftentimes what happens, the employees who sit there for that performance review, number one, they dread it, okay? Number two, there's a little thing called recency, meaning because the manager wasn't there, you know, giving them that in the moment feedback, they tend to hang on to what happened most recent just prior to that annual performance review, which may or may not even be indicative of the big picture as far as their performance scope from that year. And number three, you're actually engaging in, a, in an exchange with your employees that puts them on the defensive and makes them feel judged. We don't want that. And the way you can avoid that is in the moment feedback. You wanna make sure that your employees know what they're doing right and where they can improve as opposed to waiting until it's too late to do anything about it. So here are some important considerations for you. Consideration number one, you really have to be more flexible. Okay, so if you have a bunch of managers or if you yourself are saying, but we've never done it that way, I don't wanna do it that way, I'm too busy to do it that way, okay. Then you're gonna experience some pain points. You're gonna be an organization that's struggling. You're gonna be an organization that isn't innovating in the way that they need to, to keep up with the constant changes that are being experienced. And as a result, those you're serving, whether they be customers or uh, patients, whatever your respective um, or community at large, whatever your respective industry happens to be, you're telling them. They're not going to have a need and what they've come to expect from you 
because you are refusing to be flexible. So I really want you to, to become as comfortable as possible with the flexibility that everyone on this call has had to endure in the past six weeks and have that become implemented into your new normal as it relates to performance management. And what am I talking about? Think about it. Your employees, you, everyone in the organization has, it, has had to take on additional responsibilities and roles that they never thought they would have to take on because it truly has been an all hands on deck situation. And a large portion of that probably includes asking people to do things that they've never had an opportunity just yet to be appropriately trained on. So think about that when you're, when you're giving that uh, you know, regular feedback. It's also important for you to be flexible. You wanna show flexibility when you're evaluating your employees because we have to under, you have to understand that there's going to be a learning curve. Even though we're all in a constant state of urgency of, oh my gosh, this should have been done yesterday because we're just trying to keep up with everything that's changing. There is an inevitable learning curve that all of us have had to go through and your employees are no different. So you wanna keep that in mind. You also wanna make sure that you, you know, question what it is you're measuring in terms of performance. The performance metrics that you used before COVID-19 just might not make as much sense anymore. And I just threw out a couple examples. So maybe it was really sensible for you to evaluate your employees' performance based on the revenue they generate. Well, guess what? That totally has been, <laughs> you know, blown up in terms of that philosophy. So instead of in this example I gave, instead of evaluating your employees based on the revenue they're generating, take a look at what they're doing to demonstrate thought leadership. Thought leadership in their approach and in their innovative way of tackling their job to eventually lead to more sales. But what are they doing now in embracing this crisis situation that really sets them apart so that they're doing the best they can to make lemonade out of lemons, so to speak. Another thing I just want to say before I wrap in just a minute or two, you want to make sure that you have weekly structured communication with every employee. And I know some of you on this call are hearing me say that and you're thinking, how am I going to do that, Elizabeth? I have so many employees. Well, you know what? If you are a manager who tends to be insistent upon holding on to um, you know, all of that communication yourself as opposed to empowering your supervisory team to assist in that, Now's the time to have an open mind and think about doing things differently. So utilize your uh, you know, supervisory team to have structured communication with every employee. Every employee needs to have, from a performance management perspective, some sort of a regular touch base on a weekly basis. You also wanna make sure that instead of always focusing on output again because of the reality that COVID-19 is, you wanna make sure that instead of only focusing on that, your emphasis is based upon what they need help with, what is it they'd like to work on, and you wanna you know, agree upon between the two of you three specific takeaways that they will focus on for that week. If you don't listen to anything that else that I've said throughout this entire webinar and the only thing you focus upon is this slide right here, then I will consider this a job well done. If all of you challenge yourselves to simply implement just what you see on the slide right here, I promise you, you will see an increase in performance, a decrease in performance related concerns, and an ability to keep up with the pace of change that we're all experiencing. All right, so that is enough of my portion. I'm now going to be turning it over to Mark Kuhar. So Mark, just give me one moment. I am going to unmute you. All right, Mark, are you there? Yes, can I be heard? Yes, you can. Great. Hello. So, uh, Mark, everybody has uh, had an opportunity earlier in the webinar to see your contact information. It is also showing on the screen right now. So if you didn't get a chance to write it down earlier, please take out a pen and some paper and just jot it down right now. This is Mark's email address. This is the phone number that you can get a hold of him at. And remember what I said earlier, even if you're not an employer in the state of Pennsylvania, a large portion of what Mark is covering today relates to federal compliance. 
things, which is to everybody on this. Call. So Mark, I think what we're going to do, if it's okay with you, is start cranking through the questions that were submitted prior to today's session. And as I explained to the group, we have nine of those questions. It's very possible we only have time to get through these nine questions. And if that's the case, Mark, um, I, I hope that, well, I know you and I work together on making sure that we'll get the answers to the subsequent questions that maybe we didn't have time for, but that were submitted in the Q&A um, text box that people are sending. All right, so question number one. I have a question regarding COVID-19 and OSHA. Is it considered a reportable disease under OSHA standards? And is it up to the employee or employer to prove or disprove that they contacted it through the workplace? Okay, well, um, trying to be efficient uh, as possible and getting through as many of these as possible. Um, first, I had uh, just a, a short time ago given uh, to Elizabeth um, a link to the, to the uh, OSHA website, uh, which would uh, coach the person who asked this question and others. The short answer is, generally speaking, um, COVID-19 is not going to be OSHA reportable uh, or loggable, but um, in lieu of that, um, I would ask that you look to the link, uh, or if for some reason there's any problem with the link, um, if, if you just Google that quest, literally that question in, um, it will take you to the OSHA site. And basically it depends upon the amount of time worked um, and the uh, extent of healthcare used that will drive whether or not uh, it's a reportable or loggable situation. Most of the time it's not. Um, and as far as who has the burden to prove, um, it would basically, um, in order for it to be a problem for you to not have reported or logged it, again, in the relatively rare uh, situation where that's required, <clears throat> in order for it to be a citable offense from OSHA's standpoint, you know, they would have to be able to establish that it was a COVID case that had the characteristics requiring reporting and logging or logging, uh, but also one that occurred um, in conjunction with their work. So if if I'm tying these two things together, the burden would be on OSHA to prove that your failure to log or report, as the case may be, um, uh, was actionable because it actually was contracted at work. With respect to workers' comp, which isn't in there, for an employee to receive workers' comp, um, as with any other accident or illness, they would have to prove that uh, they contracted it at work. So I think that's what I have there. All right, perfect. And Mark, just so you know, I didn't have an opportunity to put that link, and so everybody knows, I didn't have an opportunity to put that link in this particular uh, slide deck prior to the webinar, but I will include it in the subsequent materials, and I'll also type it in the text box so everyone can see it um, today as well. Okay, question number two. Do you happen to have a resource that explains how to calculate paid sick leave in emergency FMLA for a part-time employee who needs to take intermittent leave because their child's school is closed. The employee is taking an hour here and there and on occasion a full day. Do we get a dollar figure and work to that for the maximum benefit or do we compute a max number of hours and pay those at two thirds her hourly rate assuming she doesn't have any overtime in the past six months? Uh, I can say first I'll say the latter. In other words, um, uh, expanded Family Medical Leave Act leave should be looked at and allocated based upon hours, not money. Um, so, and again, I always feel bad if I misread or misunderstand a question, but uh, uh, I think I have this one. And um, basically what you do is you calculate the amount of, uh, of Expanded Family Medical Leave Act entitlement that they have, um, and before that emergency sick, uh, so whichever the case may be, um, amount of emergency paid sick um, and, and what normally would be available under the emergency FMLA is determined based upon their hours. So for a full-time person, it's, you know, it's what they normally work. For a part-time person, it's also what they normally work, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, USDOL FAQs 20 and 21. USDOL FAQs 20 and 21 speak to this pretty well. But basically you end up saying, okay, how many, how many hours of paid sick or emergency, uh, which, which you know, it often referred to as expanded FMLA, but in any event, uh, how many hours of those things do they have? And then um, you allocate them as they're used. You could either gratuitously make them whole instead of paying them two thirds, 
or you could uh, you could uh, allow them to use PTO to uh, pay up, you know, make up the balance, or you could do neither. Um, also, I'll note, as explained in FAQs 20 and 21, uh, you're allowing employees to take this uh, e either type of FFCRA leave for uh, child care issues is discretionary. In other words, you may do it or you may choose not to do it. Again, it's all in FAQs 20 and 21. Okay, very good. And Mark, just so you know, I am actually uh, putting those websites right now into the chat box for everyone to see. All right, question number three. If an employee has a confirmed case and is off of work, when can they come back to work? Well, uh, there's several aspects to that uh, as well. If it's a really, really bad case, they may be physically unable to work. Um, you know, sometimes that stretches into the three or four week time frame. There are very few cases like that, but I'm trying to answer this as broadly as possible. In fact, I think as most people know, most people who are COVID-19 positive don't go anywhere near the hospital, let alone stay that long. But so it's possible that you could be into the week simply because they don't, um, you know, they're not able to come back. Generally speaking, let's say that we have somebody who has a light case or moderate case and they don't go to the hospital, the, uh, the uh, Department of Health, and by that I mean for Erie County, the Erie County Department of Health, and for the rest of Pennsylvania, I mean the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and again, this very much could vary um, it, with the other states, uh, but it is pushed out by the CDC, so there's a good chance, good chance, that lines up in the other states. In any event, the departments of health um, expect a person to be self-isolated for 14 days. Um, sometimes that's a little, tr a little tricky to calculate because maybe the person was already at home for two or three or five days and then gets tested. Um, you know, how many more days do they have to stay there? A lot of that's in the discretion of the health officials, but the general answer is that they have to be um, self-isolating for uh, two weeks uh, before really they're allowed to leave the house. And if they don't promise to do that, it's, it's, it's been uniformly uh, by mutual agreement. But technically, if they don't promise to do that, they get a, they get a free stay in the prison. Um, so uh, let me see if I'm missing any other aspect of that. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Okay, all right, excellent. Thank you, Mark. Question number four, under the FFCRA emergency paid sick leave, there is up to 80 hours paid. Because we are paying, paying out of the PPP loan, does this still apply to us? Right, and there's two questions there at least. Um, if you're in, the, if you're in the, um, the eight weeks associated with the PPP, your employees definitely still are eligible for the FFCRA leave. Um, either type, the highlight here is on the, on the paid sick leave, but the employees are still eligible irrespective of the fact that you have, uh, you're in your eight week period for PPP. So they're still eligible. And um, uh, you would still take the tax credit for that. What I'm unsure of, and I, and I, for those who didn't hear me disclaim this before, I confer with others here, Mark Denlinger and Elliot Ehrenreich in particular, when it comes to um, you know, pure PPP questions, but uh, what is unclear to me is um, if, it's, if it's money which you're paying out as FFCRA leave to the employees and for which you're getting a tax credit, can you take credit for that in terms of your uh, meeting the 75% associated with your PPP funds? Um, or the, um, can you take credit for that uh, uh, under the um, forgivability um, calculation that I'm not sure of and didn't have a chance to nail down. That's, that's something that we might be able to follow up on. If, okay. Again, if a, if a person has an urgent need for that answer, I encourage them to, to contact counsel who, uh, who are PPP experts. And again, Elliot Ehrenreich, Mark Denlinger are my partners who, who qualify as such. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Question number five. If I understand correctly, if we have a confirmed case, we would make disclosures to state and local health departments, as well as HHS, OSHA, and the CDC. Is this correct? Okay, well, we'll skip OSHA because we've essentially already answered that with a reference to the, uh, the blue box on their, on their, um, on their homepage, frankly. Um, 
So with respect to the other ones, actually, it usually works the other way around, believe it or not. It is far, in Erie County, uh, it is far more likely that you're gonna get a call from an employee and then um, you're going to uh, get services and have communication with um, the, uh, in Erie's case, the Erie County Department of Health. So it's not so much you telling them because in all likelihood they know before you do. Um, and, and again, some of this is a little bit surprising to some, but um, when the uh, Erie County Department of Health, um, and by the way, the reason I'm emphasizing that in addition to the fact I'm in Erie and many, many listeners are, but certainly far from all, but in any event, um, is because between Erie and West Virginia, there are only two counties that have county departments of health, believe it or not, Allegheny around Pittsburgh and Erie. Um, you get outside of those counties and it's very hard to predict how it's all gonna play out. But in any event, in Erie County, the Erie County Department of Health will know right away because the employee and or the provider will have told them. And however though, what I was starting to say was interesting is they do not call the employer. The County Department of Health does not call the employer. They don't view this as a workplace issue. Um, they view this as a healthcare issue. They, as soon as you uh, end up uh, talking to them one way or another though, they will be a fantastic resource. I just can't applaud the Erie County Department of Health and say how fortunate we are and, and other counties who have them to have one. Uh, they are a fantastic resource. I've actually been giving 20 or 25 minute uh, uh, presentations just on the issue of what happens, this very question, what happens when you have an employee with a confirmed case? It's very interesting to me. Frankly, it's very, it's very calming because it's not nearly as disruptive as one would think. Um, and I don't know that I can, well, uh, also the, I'm trying to decide how much of that to bring in here from a time management standpoint or not. We gotta always circle back if we don't have any other questions at the end. But, and just so um, you know, Mark, we don't have any new questions. Everyone's like listening intently to what you're saying. So I just to help you manage your time, we don't have any new questions yet. Okay. Okay. So in a nutshell, what happens is, and I'm sorry if this is quick, like it's being recorded. You can sort of slow it down um, yeah, later on if, if I'm too fast. But basically what happens is, is that a nurse um, at the Erie County Department of Health does what's called contact tracing, which means that she asks the indexed person, which is the positive person, she asks the indexed person the following question. During the two days prior to your first symptom or the test, which ultimately turned out to be positive, so during the two days before the earliest symptom or the test, which ever occurred earlier in time, through now, the moment that we're talking, how many people, who are they, with whom you've been in contact, and with in contact is defined to be within six feet for 10 minutes, within six feet for 10 minutes. I asked if that means consecutive minutes. She looked it up and said, yeah, we typically think in terms of consecutive minutes uh, and she being the head contact tracing nurse at the County Department of Health, she said, technically though, it's, it's not consecutive, it's 10 minutes. So the Erie County Department of Health only views people at risk for having contracted COVID from a quote index person, COVID-19 positive person, if they've been that close to somebody for, the, for that many minutes. If you, if you really think on that, that's, that's pretty comforting because other than your loved ones, how many time, how many people have you spent uh, 10 minutes with within six feet? Not too many. And then also they give great, uh, not lately anyway, they also give, uh, they give great guidance too regarding uh, cleaning surfaces and so forth. And um, uh, again, I'm sorry if this is, is too quick, but the concept here is virility. You can go online and find out that it lives for so many hours on dogs, a dog's back and so many hours on your knee and so many hours on your phone, et cetera, et cetera. It, when, where rubber hits the road is when you're dealing with a positive case and you're dealing with your Department of Health, state for most people, county uh, for Erie. Uh, and what they will tell you is that the conservative experts, um, the conservative microbiologist experts say that within 12 hours, the surface is no longer virulent. It's no longer virile. If a person, and this is, none of this is Mark Kuhar, my microbiology degree staled a long time ago, but they, uh, they're telling me that if a surface has been, um, has 12 hours have passed, that a, that a surface, even if contaminated, is no longer virile. And that's how they look at things and that's how they coach employers, including you, if you have a positive test. Well, in my experience so far, and I have had a bunch of employers who have had COVID positive employees, uh, in my experience so far, every time, by the time we figure it out, they've been out of the workplace for days and days. 
So only where an employee goes home sick with symptoms are you likely to have to honor your obligation under the PA Secretary of Health's obligation to air the place out, to sanitize it only after 24 hours and rope it off and all that. That just doesn't happen. In my experience, it hasn't happened yet um, because you find out about it um, farther in time, uh, subsequent in time to, to those times that I've mentioned. And so technically, uh, what you're really doing at that point is cleaning for optics. You're roping it off, you're cleaning for optics. You're really not cleaning to kill the germs because again, they're no longer veer off to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot in there. You can tell it's a, a, a subject of great interest and I have learned a lot from helping this employer. Then I talked to that employer and then we messaged something out there. And by the way, if you're gonna message anything to your employees, it seems like the thing that everybody's messaging is one, what we're doing to keep you safe and what your part is, okay? But, but what I found is actually more powerful and much less done or much less frequently done is what I just described, which is telling the employees what actually happens if you have a COVID positive employee. What are we gonna do about it? What is the Department of Health gonna do about it? What's that experience gonna be like? And you can just hear people exhaling when you teach people about that. Plus, think of, think of all the takeaways from what I just said. So, you know, you're busy, you need to stop the grocery store. Are you gonna do that after work at 7 p.m.? Not me, I'm gonna do it at 7 a.m. The liquor stores are opening up today, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised we have as many people listening. <laughs> but anyway, but, um, but the liquor stores in, in, in our county are opening up. Um, and the first hour of every day is, is, uh, is reserved for people who view themselves as elderly or high risk. Why do you think that is? So they can get a good start on the drinking weekend? No, it's because that overnight, just through the passage of time, any viruses from the previous day have lost their virility. Again, I could go on and on about this, but if you know some of the science behind that, how the Department of Health is going to handle things, it's incredibly liberating. You can make good decisions and, uh, and frankly, you know, lose a lot of our anxiety. Right. Okay. Excellent. I'm, thank you for going into such good detail for that. I'm sure a lot of people feel better after hearing what you had to say. All right. Question six. If we have a confirmed case, are we required to have a professional remediation team or can we do this ourselves? Do we have to close the shop until the remediation is done? Great questions, and you're kind of teasing out of me most of my presentation that I just referred to. Uh, again, what Mark Kuhar thinks about this doesn't matter, okay, right? But what does is Charlotte Berenger, the head uh, uh, COVID-19 nurse at the Erie County Department of Health, who was asked this exact question by me, and here's exactly what she told me, and she is a resource. If you want to call her, go ahead. Um, she said she's willing to serve as a resource as long as time allows. And so far, I think, I think that would still apply since the cases are still basically just trickling in. In any event, Charlotte Berenger, Erie County Department of Health, told me um, that there is no special team, no vendor, no particular disinfectant. And again, the best disinfectant is 12 hours. Um, she said, uh, absolutely, there's no reason to close the shop unless you have so many of your employees uh, who, who are positive and isolated or who have been in contact and have been asked to uh, quarantine. And that's the difference. The index person is at home um, isolated for two weeks. The corn, the I'm sorry, the yeah, the quarantine people are at home for four or five days as they get two negative tests, which the vast majority of them are negative. But um, the this is where you merge with the Erie County Department of Health says with the PA Department of Health, and that basically the sum total of the two is this: if the person has been in contact with your machines, your countertops, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the last 24 hours, the likelihood of which is low, because usually you don't even find out about it till day three, four, five. Then you have to rope it off, wait the balance of the 24 hours, and clean it up with whatever you have, Windex, Lysol, whatever. You do not need an outside firm. Uh, you do not need extra PPP or anything. And again, the passage of time is your best friend here. Would you close the shop? Uh, I, there definitely are people who have the... the um, there, it is not a recommendation that you do so from the CDC or the PA or Erie County Department's Health. They do not recommend closing anything because of this. Um, one last thing here. Nope, I think that's good. Okay, excellent. And I should have said this in the beginning for those of you who are new to this. Uh, we will send in the email follow-up we send with materials based upon this week's session. Included in that will literally be a transcript of every word Mark is speaking in his responses to the questions that were submitted. 
So I probably should have told some of you that in the beginning before you were trying to take notes. So you can sit back, relax, and know that that's coming uh, either by tomorrow or Monday at the latest. Oh, hey, real, uh, can I add one quick thing to that though? If you could pull that back sure. up. And this is sure. something, you know, uh, you know, I sense this from, you know, in my own experience, plus uh, Elizabeth and Aaron and uh, DA generally, you know, is trying to get ahead of things. I did have a client who ended up spending $40,000 fumigating their facility on day 11. So they, the employee was in there, touched some things, left, was out for a few days, went to the doctor, got tested. There was another delay, 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 delay. On the 11th day, the employer spent $40,000 fumigating the place. Why? Optics, optics, optics. That's a lot of money for optics. Okay. So so a better way, in my opinion, a better way around that is to um, have these conversations, share this information up front, because if it looks like you know what you're doing, you have a situation, then you execute on it, mm -hmm. then you don't need to undertake as many things, especially expensive things for optics. Excellent, excellent point. So we're getting to question seven. It is 11.56. Uh, Mark, are you able to hang on just, you know, a few minutes after 12 yes. noon to get yes. through? Okay. For those of you who are able to hang on with us, we invite you to do so. I will make sure, Mark and I will both make sure that we're done by 12.05 um, out of respect for your time. But um, if you can't, like I said, don't worry. We can give you the transcript afterwards. All right. Question seven. And I will... I will make a little disclaimer here. This particular question only ap applies to Pennsylvania employers because um, New York and Ohio and other states that are represented on this call today have different, um, different requirements. And they certainly, for example, New York is certainly not <laughs> opening up the floodgates for people to come back to work right now. So question seven, is there a recommended number of employees that um, should come in at one time? I see that a gathering of less than 25 is now recommended. Would that be acceptable? Yeah, my best answer to this is it's very much an evolving situation. You know, we're just we're just getting into the yellow period now. Um, the uh, reference in the uh, yellow uh, guidelines from the PA, uh, well, from the PA governor's office and the secretary of health, but basically um, they say in there that an employer should not have more than half of its, uh, of its uh, what, it, what is allowed under its occupancy permit. Those are really high numbers. We're an office building. We have oh, just shy of 100 employees at our law firm. Um, and uh, our occupancy permit allows us to have 250 people in the building. So um, you know, as far as how many employees we can have in at one time, we're, by that measure, we're allowed to have more employees in than we actually employ. So um, we're not doing that, by the way. Um, we are uh, trying to, we're trying to meet our, our client needs and also at the same time accommodate some concerns that people have uh, and also um, definitely do do right by the by the spirit of the um, of the yellow status and so we are trying to space people out this one works today the other one works tomorrow and, and do all kinds of things like that i'm not suggesting that we are you know basically filling the building up as that would allow uh, but that, that that gathering of less than 25 i have I have not seen that interpreted to apply to workforces, but rather other types of, of gatherings. And the, I think that the, uh, the, the analysis for the size of the workforce that's allowed is, is, is in relative to your occupancy permit. Okay. Okay. Excellent clarification. Thank you. Oh, I mislabeled this. I'm sorry. Question eight. I accidentally put question nine up there. Can an employee work without a mask if they have a medical reason or do they go home? If they work, do I need documentation from a doctor or can I just take their word for it? Do I need to have paperwork to track these employees? Okay, uh, great question, very practical. On, on or about October, I'm sorry, April the 20th, it might've been the night of uh, Sunday the 19th, but, but the FAQs um, from, this, from the PA Secretary of Health that came out around April 20th, talked about masks, what if, what if employees uh, can't wear them? The week before, in a video conference, she had been asked, what about employees who can't wear them for medical or safety reasons? And, and honestly, she said, uh, we, you know, I can't imagine what that would be. But apparently, they, they might, must have, at that point, after the requirement was put out there, gotten some input from the business community. I don't know. Because uh, on that weekend that preceded Monday, to April 20th, 
uh, they came up with these FAQs, which were released again, April 20th of the night of Sunday the 19th, I don't remember. And there's a lot in there on masks. Please take a look at that. Um, uh, for example, plastic face shields uh, are good enough. Um, they, um, which does make a difference to somebody with COPD, for example. Um, also, they acknowledged, they acknowledged what I thought was pretty obvious, that you don't want your employees with homemade masks and you know, little straps hanging off of them as they work over a lathe, God forbid, right? So also I have employers whose employees need to go up uh, hot, uh, utility poles, which you can't do with a homemade mask. Uh, there are special masks for that that are frankly not commercially available right now. So there's disability-based reasons, uh, emotional health reasons, like you know, genuine claustrophobia, um, and uh, operational reasons. Um, there are environments where that makes your uh, glasses steam up so much that you can't see and that presents hazards. Um, so those FAQs address all those things and, it, and they're laced with, we expect employers to try really hard. You know, we expect employers to do their best, which to me sounds like, you know, in, in good faith, I'll, see, I'll say that that, uh, you know, that sounds like they're acknowledging some, some practical limitations on, on a universal mask requirement. Technically though, and clearly the starting point is they have to have a mask. But again, I refer people back to those FAQs and see if you can't find an answer that you need in there. And there may be different people on the call who make uh, face shields. Um, I'm not trying to plug a particular one. I don't know who they are, except they do know my client Fort Erie Plastics uh, does make face shields and is, is uh, and has them available. And, and again, hopefully that doesn't sound like too much of a plug Elizabeth. I'm only mentioning that because they can be hard to find and we have a local person who, who makes them. And again, if your business does too, I'm sure Elizabeth would be happy to make people aware of that too in a subsequent uh, event. Absolutely, great, thank you. And that was our last question. So uh, thank you to everybody. There were no new questions submitted this week. That means we must have captured all of the ones that were submitted in advance pretty successfully. So thank you to everybody. I hope you have a fabulous week and keep an eye out not only for the email I sent with the materials from today, but also I will be inviting everybody to participate in a survey related to your operations and COVID-19 and share the results in next Friday's webinar. Have a great week.